Hello and welcome to Cultured Left Foot, my YouTube channel dedicated to all things football, FIFA, Pez and Football Manager. Today we're talking you through my five top tips for Football Manager 20. Number one, training. Do it yourself. All of it, sort of is the first place we're going to get to. Training is an interesting concept. Ranging from schedules to mentoring to individual training, you need to take control of it as much as you want, but definitely take control of some of it because mentoring groups are very, very useful. Well, I have one set up for my team at the moment in Spurs where you can see me live stream this game on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash cultured underscore left underscore foot. And the link is in the description below if you want to come and sign up to that and see me play as Spurs. But you'll see here I have three people in this group. I have Harry Kane in the core social group, 27 years old, a model professional, giving significant influence on the group. Mason Greenwood and Sessegnon are in there with him. They've got light influence. They're going to get all of their experience from this mentoring from Kane. None of it is going to go from Greenwood or Sessegnon back to Kane. But what does mentoring do? Well, generally... It imparts knowledge from one person to the other. They're mentoring them. That's what you want. The less people that are in there, the more focused they will get. So the minimum you can have is three. This is basically not the perfect group because Ryan Sessegnon doesn't play a similar position to Mason Greenwood and Harry Kane. I'd ideally have another striker as the third person in there. But as a demo, I thought this is perfect because Harry Kane is... Everything you want. He's a team leader, so he's higher in the high in the hierarchy, high in the dynamics. He's part of the core social group, which is probably what these guys want to be a part of in the future. He's a model professional, which is exactly a, a really good personality to have. And he has this significant influence on the group. So everything he knows, he's going to try and pass on to Mason Greenwood and Ryan Sessegnon. Now, Harry Kane obviously has some amazing stats. Although he doesn't play very well in the game, he has amazing attributes here. And he gets, gets crowd going. So what we'd be looking to do is Mason Green would be looking to learn from Harry Kane in terms of stats and player traits. So there is a chance Mason Greenwood could pick up, get crowd going, learning that from Harry Kane. Things that aren't learned, generally physical attributes aren't, aren't altered by mentoring. Mental attributes can be. Determination is one that's known to go sort of up and down depending on the group. Um, and other things apparently can be learned. Now... Why should you listen to me about this? You shouldn't. It's up to you if you want to listen to me about all this. It's completely your choice. But these are things I've learned from playing Football Manager from CMO 102 all the way until now. Even CM2 before that. But um, I just love this game and I thought it was about time I shared five tips with everybody. And the first one is training. And this is the first bit of training, mentoring groups. That's how you should set them up. Make someone that has a significant influence on the group and, and don't overload them with other people. For example, if we put, um, I don't know who's been at the club for a long time. Let's go with, where's Hugo Lloris, for example. Hugo Lloris is also having a significant impact on the group. So there is a chance that Hugo Lloris and Harry Kane will now swap traits. They will now learn traits off each other. So you might get Hugo Lloris learning gets crowd going, and you might get Harry Kane avoiding his weaker foot by learning that from Hugo Lloris. Unlikely as that is, they play in different positions, but there would then be conflicting mentors in the men for the mentorees, or the mentees, don't know how you'd phrase that. Um, Greenwood and Sessignon if they're both in the same group. So that's why I keep it just like that. Next up in training, calendars. Um, I think these are wildly underutilised by most football manager players. You can use these calendars to train certain things before a game. Now, it's not proven how much of an impact these have in terms of what they will end up doing. But they will give you a boost in certain things. So... Man City away. We did lots of train, lots of defensive training just before the game. We did defending, we did transition because we wanted to go from defence, transitioning in the press, and getting into the attack. That's what we focused on just before the game. We did lots of match practice. We did a little bit of fitness, and then a bit more transition press and one attacking session before playing Man City. We got a defensive boost from that game. It was very, very helpful. It really worked out. Arsenal, we were at home. They're really poor defensively. We mainly focused on attacking stuff. We've got team bonding going on and community outreach to really gel the players together. But if there's one thing you should take away from training and updating your schedules on here, it is having a match review after every single game you do. 
just chuck it in there. It's only available the day after a game. It has no, none, nothing at all negative about it. All it does is it helps your team increase their tactical familiarity and their team cohesion, as it says. It affects everybody. It affects everyone that played, everyone that was on a bench, everybody that's in the squad. You're basically there giving them a presentation about what went well and what didn't go well in the game. Team cohesion is increased. Tactical familiarity is increased. It really, really helps out. Should do it after nearly every game you play. Definitely go in there, edit things yourself, make it if you... My advice would be basically split it about 60-40. Leave it 60% of the assistant manager picks what you do. 40% of it, go in and update what you want to do. Because you'll see here, we don't have a game here. We do not have a game this week. There is nothing on our next game after this is Brentford on that Monday. I've given them a boot camp that week. That wasn't there. That wasn't suggested. But I've given them a boot camp because it's an international break. So whoever's here, I want them working hard. I want them putting the hours in. And I want them getting that fitness up. Because they're likely not my starting players. So if they can put the effort in and have a good working environment, put the effort in training, get a good uh, rating on the training review, there's a chance they might play in the game because the people that come back from international break will be tired. So that is the second part of training, is the calendar. Definitely go in, have a look, sort it out, do the match review. I cannot stress that enough. It really helps. It's just in here. Match prep, match review. As soon as you click it, it will disappear, but it will go into the schedule. Do that after every single game, especially early on during preseason, because it just helps new players understand what you want them to do and gel with the team and bond with the team and understand the tactic familiarity. It is crucial. The third part of training, and I this is the one I think is the easiest and again gets so overlooked, individual training individual training for each of your first team squad and if you are so inclined you can do it for your under 23s and your under 18s to make sure they're learning the positions you want them to learn we have two two formations with this first team we have a 4-2-3-1 which everyone plays really well it's working quite well our backup formation is a three at the back formation which we use occasionally but we have no one that can play a libero it won't be sane obviously we have no one that can play a libero very well. So in the individual training, I have got Foyth and Aya and Dyer all doing libero training to be a libero on support because that's what I want them to do when they play that position. They can play centre back fine. Dyer can play a defence midfielder fine. But what I want him to work on is becoming the libero to help out that third formation. This is so easy to set up. Everyone should be doing it. Everyone should be doing it to suit your formation that you play, what you want the people to do, how you want them to work. Um, so, for example, we've signed Timo Werner in this one. We're training him to be a striker, advance forward. We've changed that to attack. He wants to be a pressing forward. That's what his favourite is. Mason Greenwood inside, you'll see. The only one we haven't done it for is uh, Ben Davies because he's playing as a left back and that's his playing position. But I'm going to change that. I would prefer him to learn how to be a complete wing back on support. Everyone else, if it says... If you sign them new, it will say learning their playing position, current playing position or playing position like Ben Davies was at left back. I have now changed all of these to go through and they're learning a position that I want them to play. Apologies about that. There's some light coming through on my green screen. Point number two, manage morale of your team. Morale has been absolutely crucial and I cannot understate that in the last two or three football managers. Football 18, manager 18, it came into the system and a lot more was emphasised on it. Foot Manager 19, it was probably too overpowered. They seem to have dialed it back a little bit for 20, but it's still incredibly important to keep morale high. How do you keep morale high? Press conferences, you try and talk people up and make them make them good. If you don't do press conferences, then there's other ways around it. Sign players that people think will be good signings. If they ask you to sign someone or you've promised them to do something, make sure you keep that promise and keep morale high. Matt, promises can be found um, on your homepage. Promises, they're just up here. Obviously, I use a skin, but they are all there. Look at this. You've got people that I'm trying to promise them things. And if you keep these happy, then you're going to be all right. Harry Winks has got extremely good morale. You can bump that up by going interaction, praise player, praise conduct, passionately, pick the top one. He's delighted and he's already gone to excellent morale now. He's there. He went, where is he? Harry Winks. He's gone from um, very good to excellent morale. You can do this pretty much before every big game you're going to play 
and your morale will boost and you will see an improved performance. And it's the same thing with if people aren't playing well, if people aren't scoring goals. Go and criticise them, but criticise them in a way that makes sense. Just because you're telling about them something negative doesn't mean it's going to send their morale down the drain. If you say something negative in the right sense, their morale will go up. Morale is incredibly important. Incredibly important in Football Manager. And that is what gets you good results. It's incredible when you look at the dynamic screen, if I can find it. If you look at the dynamic screen, look at happiness. You want all of these to basically be green. This is what works out how good their morale is. Management. So Hugo is dissatisfied with your management. Positives, none. Negatives, none. All we can read into that is that he thinks we're underperforming. Or we did last season. Harry Kane, concerned. Minor issue. Unhappy to have been touted out to other clubs. Concerned, none, none. But he's concerned about his playing time. It's because we're not playing him yet. And this screen is ridiculously important. So keep an eye on this screen. Keep an eye on your morale. And make sure you do all you can to boost that morale up. And it's not only in your first team let's go for here anthony giorgio will go interaction will praise the player will praise his conduct passionately there you go he's very happy you can do that basically twice a week you can do it twice a week until they get pissed off and then they'll say oh we've been over this already don't worry about it but manage your morale key point in football manager number three when making a signing use all the tools and the data at your disposal that means scout ratings use them don't heavily rely on them use historic stats Timo Werner for example we paid 52 million for him everyone knows Timo Werner is absolutely incredible he is brilliant so it wasn't hard to make that decision to bring him in he scored 17 goals in 30 games in a very good division in the Bundesliga and got a 7.31 very, very good performance. Very useful thing to do. You know he is a goal scorer. He scored over one, well, more than one in two. And that is useful to do. This becomes... I can't stress this enough. This history page, this page of their overall stats is absolutely crucial for deciding whether you should buy a player or not. Has that player done it for previous seasons in an equivalent league? That's what you need to look at. If you're looking at someone further down the line and you see that they have been playing in the Champions League, uh, in the Championship, sorry, and they've been performing above a 7.2 or a 7.3 consistently in the Championship, they'll probably be able to cut it in the Premier League. If you're looking at someone that's had two seasons in League One and been getting a 7.2, made it up to the Championship, got a 6.9 and his scoring's gone down, but he's English, so his value's really high, and his star ratings are quite high because he's English and he helps towards your homegrown nationality. I would look at that history of him and say, yeah, but he struggled to go from League One to Championship, so he's not going to make it in the Premier League. That page is such a crucial key on what you should be looking for. Lukas Ahovic is a bad example. I bought him just because I love the guy. But um, it, it's such a key key part of making signings see how they've performed in other leagues which are equivalent to yours how does that league that they've got that great rating in compare to yours why is someone at man united on the transfer list when he's worth 70 million and he's transfer list for 30 but if you go in that history and he's been averaging 6.3 or 6.4 or 6.5 in the Premier League, it's just because he can't hack it in the Premier League. Don't sign him. Look at the history. If it's a striker, how many goals has he scored per game? How many assists has he got? If it's a winger, how many assists has he got? How many key passes is a central midfielder doing? It's all there. You can see it all. You can see it all down here. Eric Dyer, fouls per game, fouls against, dribbles, passes, tackling, reds, yellows. Look at this for every player that you want to sign. If you're a big team, this is crucial because not every well-statted player is going to improve your team. Next up, you want to look at scout reports. Obviously, that's what they're there for. They are there to help. Let's go and have a look at um, oh, Oxlade Chamberlain. He's on my transfer list. He's on the transfer list. I was interested in buying him. Um, we went and scouted him. 76 rated would be a very good signing. Stats and attributes look good. He's got player traits that I like to do. He runs with the ball often, cuts inside from the wings if you play him out there. Don't like trades it to play with other trouble. Take everything off this screen. Take it all in. See what you can get. How has he got on? He's been all right. For an attacking player, he hasn't scored in 18 games. Of those 18 games, 10 of them were starts. 
those 10 starts, he made 1.97 tackles a game. He had 91% passing. That's great. He dribbled a lot, 2.28 times a game. Um, fouls against, 23. He was winning a lot of fouls. Use all this information. Will he fit in your team looking at that info? That is what you want to look at. It is crucial to take all this on board to say, how has he been playing in this division? Will he fit my team? 6.79 isn't the best. I would then go into looking at other stuff. Comparison is a tool that I do not see enough people use. It is there to make your life easier. Right, we want to bring in Oxlade Chamberlain to potentially replace uh, Harry Winks, let's say. We want to bring him in to replace Harry Winks. It's the first name I saw. Ross will be annoyed with me. But Oxlade Chamberlain, right. Straight away, there's your chart. Right, Oxlade Chamberlain is quicker. He's got better vision. They've got the same attacking. He's better technically. He's better in the air. Mental's the same. Harry Winks is a better defender. Physically, Oxlade Chamberlain's better there. If you're looking for a defensive player, probably take Harry Winks. If you're looking for an attacking player in this role, you would probably take Oxlade Chamberlain. Then you've got a way in. He's 27. He's 24. Um, the height, he's 5'9. He's 5'9. They weigh similar. They're both right footed, so that's okay. Attributes. This like, literally lays it down as obvious as you could tell what to do and who is better. We want him as a midfield centre, let's say as a central midfielder on attack. These are, the, these are the attributes you're looking to use. They're not doing this to trick you. This is all there to help. To help you make informed signings. So, what are we looking at? Dribbling, Oxley chamberlains is better. First touch, they're the same. Long shots, Oxley chamberlains is better. Passing, they're the same. Tackling, Winks is better. Technique, they're the same. And it's just like average. On average, Oxley chamberlain is one stat better than Harry Winks in technical. Mental, they're the same. Physical, uh, Oxley chamberlain is better in two. And then again, you go back to it all and compare what you've seen from the history, from the comparison... To, and the scouting report to see what it is. Fairly susceptible to injuries. Everyone knows that about Oxley chamberlain Then you weigh up, is the gamble you're going to buy and the money you're going to spend worth that gamble for the injury proness? I can't stress it enough. People just go in, they'll go to their scouting page, they'll go players. I've been guilty of this. I've been massively guilty of this. Player search, who's the most valuable? Who's the most valuable on the transfer list? This guy here. Um, yeah, he looks pretty decent. What do they want for him? They want six million. Half price? Bargain. I'll go and buy him. Yeah, but why is he transfer listed? He played 11 games for Bournemouth. He got a 6.6. .6. That's not good enough to win the league. That is not good enough to win the league. Out of those six starts, five sub-appearances, he really didn't do very much. 4.3 on tackles per game is pretty good, to be fair, but he gave four fouls away. Like, he's... Isn't, there's not enough there to show you that he should be making the step up to another team. There's not enough there he should be shown to do it. Don't go based on value. Value is linked to rep. Rep is just linked to the player and the player the club plays for. That's all it's linked to. Go and look at the history and combine that with the scouting report and combine that with a comparison of someone in your current squad who you think they should be better than. Use all the tools at your disposal when making transfers. Number four... Never sub off a high-rated player unless they've got a serious injury. When I say high-rated player, we're going into a match now, just so I can show you this. We're going to rush through this because I've already played this game um, as part of the Twitch stream. But, you know, don't... The Football Manager is a spreadsheet. It's a spreadsheet showing you dots on the screen, showing you people on the screen, whatever, however you play it, it's showing it that way. What you want to do is you don't want to mess with that. It is based, there is a key reason why you have on your, on here, if you wanted to, you can put in, and I recommend you do it, I don't know why I don't have it on there at the moment, average rating. These ratings are determining how well your players are playing in, in, in line with an algorithm in Football Manager. You want to look at those average ratings and you want to make them as high as possible. So, if you go... 1-0 up with Giovanni Lo Celso scoring a header, then his rating will boost. If you're 1-0 up and you're going into the 80th minute and he's on 60% fitness, leave him on the pitch. You lower that average rating, you're taking off someone that's playing the best in the game and your average rating will plummet and there's more chance West Ham will score. I guarantee you this. 
I guarantee you, if you're winning by one or two goals and you take off a high-rated player in a game which is reasonably close, the opposition will score. They will definitely score. That, for me, is a key part of this. I highly use rating over fitness. If someone is knackered, just give them two days rest after the game. This is a game simulation. It's not actual real life. You can just rest players for two days, they get back to 100% fitness, and then they'll be fit to play the next game. Use your, use your player rating as a barometer of who should stay on the pitch. That is the key factor of one of my top five tips. Key ratings and ratings are much cr more crucial to how the game is being played than fitness. Sure, there's going to be people out there that don't agree with me, but these ratings are much more important than condition and fitness. If you get someone with an injury that you have to take off, then obviously you have to take them off. But if you're playing like this, it's a close game, do not take your best rated player off the pitch. I only do that when I'm like 4-0 up and they've scored a hat-trick, or I'm 4-0 up and I can afford to rest them because it's the second half. I have seen games where I've been 3-1 up and I've taken someone off who's on an 8.6 because he's tired and then gone and drawn 3-3. I can't stress it enough, do not sub off well players that are playing really well unless you are incredibly comfortable in the game. Point number five. Your assistant manager can do more than suggest tactical tweaks. He can actually suggest to you who the best substitutes are to bring on. This is really, really good, and I really don't think people understand and realise this. If you go into your tactic screen, you have different options. For example, if we wanted to bring a striker on, I have on the bench Richarlison and Luka Zahovic that can come on and play in that position. Look, if you go for Werner, it comes up with this little green mark next to Richarlison's name saying, in this game, for how you want him playing, Richarlison is my favoured sub. This is the one he recommends. That little green symbol is what that means. And most players, if you have more than one option on the bench to play that position, will get a recommendation. Richarlison is a better attacking inverted winger than Ryan Sessegnon. Giovanni Lo Celso, three players can play in that position. Out of the ones we've got, Harry Winks is the best place to do it. The key thing for this... Right back, we have potentially three players that can play right back there. Alderweireld, Sessegnon or Foyth. He recommends bringing on Alderweireld and then probably changing it up to be a bit more of a defensive player because we're 1-0 up. This is dependent in-game how it's going at that time. The assistant manager is very good at recommending players to bring on in certain positions. Now again, like everything in Football Manager, you don't have to trust him. Use your own judgment. You know your squad better than the AI. You know your squad better than a fictional computer assistant manager. You know what you want to do with that role. If I want to bring on Luka Zahovic for Timo Werner, I'm going to do it. It doesn't matter if he recommends it. It does only get recommended if you pull that player's name down first. Don't go with that sub up there. It will then recommend. That is my fifth tip and my final of my top five. If you've enjoyed the video... We're going to let this game play out behind us. If you've enjoyed the video, please do let me know. If you want to see more tips and tricks from me, I, it's not normally what I do, but I'm happy to do it. I've been playing this game for years. I take really small teams from really low divisions and try and get them to win the Champions League. That's what I enjoy doing. I like to think I've got a good knowledge of the game. As I said before, you can come and see me playing it on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash cultured underscore left underscore foot. Or you can watch a daily video on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. Just hit that subscribe button in the bottom right. But as this game against West Ham plays out, and as you can see, we're absolutely dominating them at the moment. But as this game plays out, I'll say thank you very much. If you've enjoyed it, leave a like. Leave some comments down below about what other tips you would like to see, if there are any at all. And what are your top five tips that you think people might not know in Football Manager? But thank you so much for warning. For warning? I was going to say Timo Werner's going to score. Thank you so much for watching. For now, I'm out. Cheers.